Hey, Sea Fox, I've been listening to you guys for 50 years, so you can give me that 50 grand. Otherwise, you guys can go and fox yourself. Anyway, in this episode, I'm going to look at a DCR TRV 110. This has got an oddball problem. It looks like bad heads. It's not. I'm going to teach you guys how to fix this one. It's a real simple fix to get your old camera up and running again. Check it out. This is the first generation of the uh, Digital 8 camera and this that this camera has got lots of hours on it I used to use this as a slave recorder make backup copies while I was recording on a hi8 for example or even on Betacam I had ran this as a slave recorder because I could plug I could plug in to my other my broadcast camera and make a digital tape at the same time as I was shooting analog this one's has worked in the past. It hasn't been used for a while. I uh, hauled it out to do a transfer and this is what I got. You know, the picture is badly pixelating. I kill that sound there before I get get to nailed for copyright, but picture is freezing and pixelating. And no, it's not it's not dirty heads because I have tried to clean the heads a couple times on this and it's not doing it. Now if I put an analog tape in, let's look at what an analog tape is doing. So if I press play, it'll detect that this is an analog tape. Switch to analog. And I don't have a picture. Unless I go into pause. Or go into fast forward. Looks like I've got a, a clogged head is what it looks like. But again, the heads have been cleaned. And the heads don't appear to be dirty. What I do believe has happened on this is we've lost the output from one of the heads. This is the camera that there was a three-part video done on changing this, this chassis, the part that lifts up and down, because what happened on this was the, the ribbon cable that uh, connects the chassis to the main board was damaged by, they had a defective uh, uh, cassette loader on these ones. What actually happened on those, I'll show you. We'll just open the tape compartment up. I'm hoping this is going to be a real simple fix. What I'm thinking it is, I'm thinking it's one of the edge connectors where the head plugs into the main board has uh, lost connectivity. That's what I think. But the big problem with this type of chassis, this was the, the, the type B mechanism. And what used to happen on these all the time, right down here, there, there's a little foot that, that locks the uh, compartment down. And it's actually this little piece right here. This little piece had a sharp burr on it. And what it would do is, as it, as it opened and closed, if you look at the ribbon cable here, it would actually cut, it would actually wear and cut through this and sever the traces which would interrupt the signal from the rotation sensor here and it would go into an emergency shutdown as if the tape wasn't rotating. That's what would happen on these ones. And the only solution was to change this chassis because you couldn't get this ribbon cable. It was it was all part of this chassis so the, the chassis had to be changed which is what I did on this. I, I changed the chassis on this unit uh, a few years back, did a did three-part video on it um, because it wouldn't record. It would just it would just shut down. It would come up with I think it was a C thirty one twenty two or one of those errors. I forget the one, but came out with an error. Um, we're gonna pop this one apart. Just take the side cover off of it. I don't know. I forget how far I have to tear this down, but see if I can get this thing to play back. the symptom it's got looks like it looks like dirty heads but the fact that I've run the cleaning tape through it several times and it hasn't improved 
tells me it's more than just the heads are dirty. This camcorder here was made in, uh, when was this one made? 99, I think. Is there a date on this thing? Yeah, January 99. This was the very first generation of the uh, Digital 8 cameras. And for the longest time, I used this thing as a, well, I used it as an editing deck. I used this to dump the output. To when, when I was shooting on DV, for example, I would uh, dump the uh, output. That tape that I was just showing you of the dancers there, that was one of, that was one of my commercial shoots that I did. And uh, it was a two-camera shoot. And it would have been shot on, on DV. And uh, it was probably shot with a uh, VX1000, I'm thinking. And... The JVC uh, GY DV500. I think those were the two cameras that were being used on that particular shoot. Could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm just going to lower this transport down here. Don't need it open. I'm pretty sure that those were the cameras that I was using when I did that that particular production. Because I did lots of uh, productions like that. I did lots of. Um, theatrical work, uh, concerts, like local bands would hire me to go in with a couple cameras and we'd go into like a club or a bar and we would shoot. I did lots and lots. In fact, I think these were, and these were productions that I wasn't working with my, my business partner, the one that, the one that kicked. <laughs> he, uh, we did corporate stuff together and, uh, I did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of individual, like for hire multi-camera shoots live stuff, theater work, and uh, and the likes. I think these all have to come out. This front should pop off on here if I've got all the screws out, which annoying me, I don't. I'm sure I'm missing one here somewhere. It's been a while since I've opened one of these ones up. In fact, the last time I opened up one of these cameras was probably this one. There we go. Okay, unplug this connector right here. And the side cover should pop off this one. Providing I haven't missed another another screw on here. Somehow I think I've missed another screw. But where is it? I gotta pull the side cover off first. Oh, we gotta pull this back off. And I guess I gotta take out these ones too. And this should pop off. There we go. Take that one out there. Oops. Here, don't want to rip that cable out. And of course, there's one more screw right down here. Always one last screw. Okay, now, now the side cover will pop off. Plug that. We're going to unplug uh, this one, I guess. And unplug that one. Set that aside. I'm thinking the problem is the good old edge connectors on the bottom. That's where I think the problem is, is the edge connectors. It's always the edge connectors. So let's just let's just unplug them and reseat them and uh, see whether that fixes the problem. This is the head connector here. This is the RF connector. So we'll just remove that one and re I can reseat it. I'll just do them all actually. That's the drum. I'll put, I'll put a drop of deoxid on all these connectors and then we'll put it back together and see whether that fixes the problem.
grab my deoxit. We'll just use the D100 in the liquid dropper bottle. I don't really need to even scrub these because just the action of removing them and reinstalling them will be enough to clean them. I've got a missing screw here. Well, that will never do. We'll just put the missing screw back in. These edge connectors are the number one source of problems on a lot of these camcorders. This is the one that the switch was modded on. You see? If you look down here, I'm running this in real time, by the way, so you guys can see how long it took to fix it. See this? This little switch? This is the switch that normally is activated to turn on the little green screen and disable the auto gain. Um, normally what happens when you flip it in night shot, that this is the the lever that moves the filter out of the way, right? The uh, infrared cut filter. And it would activate that switch, which turns on that green hue to the, the, the uh, image. And it, uh, of course, then opens up the iris wide so that if you're trying to use one of those filters, it'll blow out the picture. But with this little mod, by just taking this, loosening off the switch and moving it out of the way so that it cannot get uh, deactivated, It uh, allows an infrared cut filter to operate on this camera without um, overexposing with one of those uh, infrared pass filters. This, what this does is this removes the infrared cut filter. So normally in that mode, the infrared filter is in place. When you flip it up, the infrared filter is moved out of the way from the CCD. So the CCD can see the full infrared spectrum. Anyway, that's, that's that. That's all you need to do on these old first generation cameras. <clears throat> they changed them in later years so that they, they actually had a corrective uh, element to the uh, infrared cut filter. So when you when you remove the infrared cut filter, if you did not activate the switch, it would not correct the focus and everything would be out of focus. So that was the, that was the way they combated people doing this, was they actually made the infrared cut filter part of an active part of the focusing system. So that was that was Sony's response to stop people from using those uh, infrared pass filters. Was uh, oh, you know what? Don't oh, I didn't forget a screw. It was the one holding on the shield. Right? I think it was the shield was held on, or wasn't it? Maybe not. Maybe the shield was held on by another screw. Where was it going on here? No, the shield's held on by another screw. There was a screw missing. Well, we'll just put one in. We'll put one in the board here. I don't think it matters, but I'll find a screw for it. I think the board probably is grounded. No problem, but I think there probably was one there at one point. And when I had the camera apart, I didn't put it back in. So we'll just put the screw back in there.
For a change, they have a ribbon cable that's actually long enough to uh, connect it without breaking it. Okay, now I should be able to pop up. Let me uh, get the battery compartment back in place. That wasn't part of that. Dope. Go fox yourself. How to say that. Now I'm in the contest for 50 grand for C Fox Radio. Is holding this up here. What is holding it up? The back piece here. There we go. Okay. I'll put a couple screws in here just so we can test this unit. Just a couple screws to hold it together for now, like that one and this one over here. And maybe one or two of them in the bottom good enough for now gotta reconnect the uh, no I don't have to connect that for testing that's just a microphone I can plug the monitor directly into the outputs here, not the right cord, try the right one, and plug the monitor in and plug in power and I think I can turn it on without this because this is just the uh, microphone, yeah that's just the microphone, uh, so I can power it up and I should be able to get a picture off of it and we'll see whether I get a complete picture or partial picture. Okay, it's on. Let's try the uh, analog tape. Let's see whether I get a picture. Play. Got to figure out that it's a high tape. Now it's gone down to, uh, and voila, we have a picture. 
See, it didn't do anything other than those connectors. Did not clean the heads again because I already did that. Let's go and put the digital tape in. That's why they tell you on the cleaning tapes, right? It'll say, you know, put the cleaning, put the cleaning cassette in, and do not use it more than four times in a row because if it doesn't clean the heads after four 10 second uh, operations of the cleaning tape, all you're going to do is wear the heads down faster. So if it doesn't work, usually it works right away. Those cleaning tapes are actually pretty efficient. The dry cleaning tapes, which is pretty much what you got to use for for eight millimeter and uh, mini DV because you're dealing with a metal tape. So you pretty much have to you pretty much have to grind the dirt off because you get a metal clog. Um, it will not uh, it will not dissolve alcohol will not dissolve metal. Uh, it's, you know, it's not an oxide; it's a metal particle. So the only way to get it off is to basically file it off with a, an abrasive cleaning tape. Which is fine if the heads are actually dirty. It'll just remove the dirt. But if the heads are not dirty and you keep running one of these things through it, you're actually going to remove a bit of the surface of the head. Which is not good. Okay, play. You know, watch how fast this tape moves in this thing here. See, the tape moves pretty quick on digital 8. And this is the picture. This is some of the production work that I used to do. I used to do lots of this type of stuff. So we had, I'd get hired by these uh, these dance companies, right? That were putting on their shows. And uh, I would get hired and I'd go to the theater and we'd set it up with two cameras and record. And some of the stuff was actually broadcast on community TV when I did it. So I obviously can't play the soundtrack because we'll get nailed for, we'll get nailed for copyright, but. Where is it here? Anyway, that's what uh, that's what I used to do when I was uh, doing productions, and I've still got most of my most of my master tapes. I've still got them. This was recorded. What date was this one recorded? It might even tell me if I look at the uh, data screen. It might even show me on here. There it was. There we go. March twenty fifth, nineteen ninety nine. So it even, it even shows the time that it, this wouldn't have been recorded at 8.37 in the morning. And I think my AM and PM was off when I did this. I had the clock set wrong. But this would have been actually recorded. Uh, this would have been the camera that, lo that logged that, I think. Or it might have been when I was editing. I, it, this may have been laid down when I was editing. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's what I used to do. I'd take two cameras in and uh, film shows. I got lots of uh, lots of rock bands, you know, lots of amateur rock bands. I'd love to show them, but I, I, the, everything, that, everything that was played, people were not doing original music. They were, um, they were doing cover songs, so there's no point. If I play it, I'm just going to get hit with copyright, so. But uh, anyway, I got lots of, I got lots of tapes that I did over the years when I was doing production, but that's uh, that's Digital 8 Master, and it would have been shot on um, would have been shot on DV. It might actually this might this may have been shot on High 8. Come to think of it, uh, it may have been shot with the EVW 300 because this would have been before I got the GV uh, DV 500. I got the GV DV 500 in 2000, so this was probably shot on. It was probably shot on EVW 300 and uh, possibly the VX3 for the second camera or um, or a VX1000. Might have been a VX1000 and an EVW 300. Anyway, quality wise, you know, it's certainly not HD, but uh, you know, we weren't shooting HD back then. Everything was being shot in standard definition. For distribution on DVD and uh, and VHS tape, and basically what happens is these 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 production these these uh, uh, dance companies they'd have all these different performers, and then they would hire me to come in and film the performance because all the performers would end up getting a copy. This would be like their year end of all the stuff they'd been doing for the entire year, and uh, they'd hire me and bring me in, and uh, we'd film these. And I used to do these on a regular basis. And then it was all it was all done for the performers. Anyway, that just shows what went wrong with this camera. If you've got one of these 
B mechanism or even the A mechanism and you've got weird things happening, check those edge connectors. Like the, the errors like the, C, the, the C32 and so forth, which is the take up spool not turning, that's caused by bad connections on the connectors or that ribbon, that uh, the ribbon cable that breaks. This tape, this was uh, the old Symphony of Fire. This was shot on high eight. This is high eight playback. And this would have been the original tape shot in the EVW 300. Is what this shot this tape. It wasn't bad. You know, it actually looked pretty good. I don't know how it's coming across on camera because there's light and everything in here. So the uh, you're getting reflections off the plasma screen, but uh, it, it didn't look bad. It actually, I think, I think this camera here, the EBW 300 being an analog camera, it actually, when I, I compared doing the fireworks on uh, Mini DV, and I think the analog ones looked actually better. Just because uh, Mini DV did not have very good... Um, color, uh, uh, the, the subsampling for the color, I don't think was as good as recording on analog. But these actually didn't look too bad, playback. That's one of the strengths though to these Digital 8 cameras is that they can play back analog. That's what makes these cameras as valuable as they are because uh, they were made after the capacitor problem. And uh, the ones that have the analog playback capability uh, just it really they're, they're, it, it, they hold their value well uh, the only thing that the downside on this particular camera I'm just going to start putting this thing together is that this being the first generation it will only record and play in the SP speed so if you get a tape that was recorded in LP the later models had LP as well as SP this one here will not play an LP tape. If I put an LP tape in here, it'll play it at uh, you know one and a half times the normal speed, because uh, the LP speed would be like a a, a regular 120 minute high eight tape like this. And, and and I wasn't even using high eight tapes a lot of times. I was using regular tapes, but a, a 120 minute high eight tape would run for 60 minutes in digital eight, or 90 minutes in the LP speed. But this camera will only play it back in SP, so it will uh, play it at one and a half times normal speed. So if you're looking to buy an, uh, a Digital 8 camera, like for archiving, uh, and you've got Digital 8 tapes, don't get the first generation because the uh, it won't play back. If, 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 if you've got tapes recorded in LP, and I always tell people, you know, don't ever use LP, but we all did it. I used to use LP all the time. Uh, I would use these Maxell. I think they were Maxell. Um, they were they were the Maxell 180s, 180 minute tapes for uh, analog. They were not high eight. They were just regular eight tapes. But they were the, they were 180 minute. I've got a bunch of them. And uh, the reason I would buy those tapes is because I could put the the recorder that I used, which was the the GVD 800. I could put it into LP and it would give me two hours and I think it was two hours and 15 minutes on a tape, which was good enough. I could get an hour, I could get two hours. And I wanted two hours because a lot of times doing long form stuff like, like these uh, shows or um, doing weddings and stuff, I was, I needed more than an hour. I didn't want to be changing tapes. When I was doing dubs, I wanted everything all in one tape, so I had to use the longer recording speed. And 90 minutes sometimes wouldn't cut it. I'm just going to try and get this thing back together and get all the screws in here and make sure it still works once I snap everything together. Last couple screws, and then we'll give it one final test, and then I can safely say that this one is also fixed. Now all my cameras are working. That's what happens when you leave your equipment sitting around and you're not using it all the time. Is that uh, they tend to go bad. I don't use this one that much for conversion. I use I have two other I have two other digital light cameras that I use for uh, doing conversions. So this one here doesn't see a lot of use.
I have a couple of seven, was it seven twenties or seven thirties? Anyway, I got a couple of those, two of them, and I got the GV, uh, the GVD eight hundred, which are the ones that I normally use for archiving. And then this one is just a kind of a, a spare because this camera has probably a thousand hours or more on the heads. It's this one's really had a lot of use, which is this one here. test and then put this one away so it'll break down again the next time I go to use it. Got a tape loaded, turn it on. And there. That was a night shot on by the way. Oops. Hit the switch there. Um yeah with that uh, that green hue switch defeated, if you put it in night shot mode, you get a full color picture, but you just get everything looking red because uh, it's not removing the infrared. There's not a hell of a lot of infrared in here because most of the lights here, well, I guess the fluorescence will throw some infrared. But uh, the LEDs typically won't throw that much infrared. But there's without it, or with the filter on. Uh, Zoom, yeah, the zoom is working, sort of. There we go, that's working a little better. Okay, do a test recording here and record. So here's a recording in digital eight. You can see the, probably the edges around here. You can see the, the pixelation around the sensor. What does it do if I turn on the infrared, turn off the infrared cut filter and film the TV? Okay, I'm going to play this back. Okay, and here's the recording. <clears throat> well, there's some, obviously there's some analog on this tape. <laughs> it's going to play it back and it's going to switch. There we go. Now it's going to go back to digital. So and here's the recording in digital 8. You can see the, probably the edges. Around here, you can see the, the pixelation. See what I'm talking about? The sensor. Look at the cord. What does it do if I turn off the infrared? Turn off the infrared cut filter and film the TV. Okay, we'll play this back. And it'll switch down to analog now because there was some stuff I recorded. I actually recorded this. This is just off my little test channel. But I recorded this using that. Uh, this was recorded on that uh, uh, CCD V110 plugged into that tuner timer. And I just recorded some of my test footage using that camera to show how it records the deck as a deck. So there it is playing back a recording made off of the tuner timer unit and the CCD V110. Thanks for watching. We'll uh, catch you again real soon. What's going on here? There we go. Catch you in the next one. Bye for now.